thank you all for being here. You're not exciting. You know, you never know when I leave when I leave Manhattan how many people are going to show up. So this is really exciting to see all of you here to see that you're interested in better medicine. Uh, you've been in school for about a month now, right? Yep. So fall is not far behind. Uh, things are progressing along. So what we're going to talk about today is a little bit about veterinary medicine in general. I want to get to talk to you a little bit about careers and those sorts of things. And then talk to you specifically about how to get into veterinary school. There are only 30 veterinary schools throughout the United States. Only 30. Not every state has one, in fact. And so, uh, you know, it is competitive. In fact, we're in the middle of our admissions process right now. In fact, tomorrow is the deadline for admissions for the fall of 2017. So the students that apply this past summer and this fall, the application period is from June 1st to September 15th every year. So the people that have to get everything in by tomorrow, postmark, I know later than tomorrow, they won't start school until fall 2017, so next fall. So we're kind of right in the middle of that. Um, we usually have about uh, 1,200, 1,300 applicants for 112 positions. Now that doesn't, uh, I don't want to scare anybody off because of the numbers. It's not nearly that bad. And we have two pools. We have a Kansas pool and a non-resident pool. In the Kansas pool, we usually have about 100 applicants for 45 positions, and so it's about two or three to one, uh, generally speaking. And so it is competitive, but it's not nearly as bad as 10 or 12 to one. So, uh, but anyway, we'll talk more about that here in a couple minutes. This uh, lecture series, I think this is our fifth or sixth year, I'm not sure, but we've been coming down here, and uh, we do six lectures in the fall and six lectures in the spring. And I bring faculty members generally from Kansas State's University, it's College of Veterinary Medicine, they talk about uh, what they do, uh, how they became whatever they are, like if they're board certified cardiologist or neurologist or ophthalmologist or whatever it might be. Uh, they'll tell you about uh, you know what took to become a board certified person in that field, and then they'll probably present some cases. Most of them present cases, kind of work through some things with you, and uh, just give you some really good good ideas of what's what goes on there. So today, September 14th, so I'm here. Uh, Two weeks from now, September 28th, Dr. Brad Cryer is going to be here. He's in charge of our shelter medicine program. Just a year ago, we bought a 32-foot trailer. Uh, That's a pretty large trailer. It pulls with a big dually pickup. And inside of that trailer looks exactly like our surgery room in the clinic. It's got two surgery tables in that uh, trailer. And so what they do with this shelter medicine trailer is they take it to shelters throughout Kansas. I think they have now over 13 on contract. They go as far north as Beatrice, Nebraska uh, as well. And they uh, generally go to smaller shelters that don't have good surgery suites or personnel to do space and neuters. Um, You know, dogs, cats, or other animals are there. And so we take uh, Dr. Crower. uh, He's from Seattle. He joined us about a year ago, as I said earlier. And uh, he takes students on the road with this trailer to these shelters, and then they'll spay and neuter dogs uh, for the shelter. They'll leave them there, and then there will be a veterinarian, a local veterinarian, that will take care of these animals until they're adopted. So, and we don't charge the humane societies for going. So it's really a good deal for everybody involved. So the, the animals have been good because they're spayed, neutered, they've been vaccinated, they're de-parasitized, or have their parasiticals and all that sort of stuff. So they're ready to be adopted, so they're more adoptable once our students get done doing the surgeries and you know, uh, get them all ready to be adopted. So the animals certainly benefit. The Humane Society's benefit because they don't have to pay for surgeons or people to do the surgery. And then our students benefit because they get to learn how to do the surgery under the direct tutelage of Dr. Crowder. I was talking to a senior student the other day, and she told me, she said, a two-week rotation in the shelter medicine program with that tra- on that trailer, she did 50 surgeries. Well, I was talking to her, another student walked up to me and got into the conversation, and she said, that's nothing. I did seven. I mean, that is truly amazing when you think about it. Our students are graduating having been 50 to 70 surgeries before they graduate. Now, I know you don't like stories of when I was in school for old white-haired guys, but I'm going to tell you, when, when I was in school stories, I got to spend one dog while I was in school. Our students are now doing 70. So see, it's not only about knowledge that we want you to get. We want you to get hands-on skills. We want you, whenever you graduate from the College of Veterinary Medicine, Kansas State University, to be able to go to work. And so, and you will be able to. You'll have all kinds of opportunities to develop hands-on skills as well as get the knowledge you need to be a good veterinarian. So anyway, he's going to be here. It's exciting. He'll probably bring some students with him. Uh, you all want to come back and hear him because uh, he'll have an exciting story to tell you. And he'll show you pictures of the trailer, pictures of it. Sorry, you're sweet. Some of the animals they spay, and uh, I'm pretty sure that he'll bring students he has in the past, and that'll be an exciting uh, presentation. 
October 12th, Dr. Susan Nelson will be here. She's in our community practice, which means she operates a clinic inside of our uh, clinic, inside of our facilities, just like your local practitioner, just like your local veterinarian. See, we want our students to know all of, everything in terms of the very sophisticated down to the very, very routine. So we want to know how to do space, neuters, vaccinations, uh, animal blend expressions, all sorts of neat things. And so she's going to talk to you, though, on that day, on October 12th, about internal and external parasite prevention for your dogs and cats, um, and kind of what program we pres we prescribe there at Kansas State University, just so you have some idea of, okay, how do we do in this? For example, how many of you have dogs at home? How many of your dogs on heartworm prevention? Well, some of them are, some of them aren't. I see some hands kind of going like this. Uh, she'll talk to you probably about uh, some heartworm prevention. Uh, Thanks, you ought to be doing. I've got a Welsh Corgi at home. He's 11 years old. Anybody got a Welsh Corgi? Those short legs, they're herding dogs. They love to herd people. They love to herd ducks and, and cattle and everything else. Uh, that's a natural instinct. But um, he gets his heartworm uh, prevention medicine every single month because heartworms are a real problem throughout Kansas. So um, she'll probably talk about that. She'll talk about other parasites as well, uh, all kinds of creepy crawly things, worms, whatever it might be. Things on the outside of the body, ticks, fleas, all that stuff. So anyway, she'll be talking about that. Dr. Beth Davis is an equine veterinarian. She's going to be talking to you about opportunities in equine veterinary medicine and, uh, and tell you about some of the cases. And Trisha presents her three cases. Uh, of course, anybody got horses at home? <coughs> Some of do this have horses. So uh, yeah, she's uh, pretty exciting. Uh, you know, she'll be a really exciting presentation. And so uh, about horses. Dr. Paige Adams is on the faculty here at Case State Lake, and she'll talk about one health. And the problem here at the marriage of human and veterinary medicine, you see we're all animals. You and I are animals, just like our four friends are animals. And so uh, there's a big uh, movement on now to call One Health, uh, Global Health, if you will, those sorts of things. And so she'll talk about how we all learn from each other, how we learn from our medical uh, colleagues, how they learn from us, uh, how we're all in this together. We're all really uh, you know, just different animals. And so uh, she'll do an exciting uh, presentation on the November 9th. And then we'll have Dr. Neil Boiler, Boiler here, November 30th, and she's going to talk about pet practice again. Uh, she's from the community practice group, and so she'll uh, give you some cases and talk to you about, uh, you know, her pet practice. Then we're going to develop a, a schedule for the spring. So six, six lectures in the fall, six lectures in the spring, and we hope that you'll be able to come to as many as you'd like to come to. And, uh, be a part of this group. So that's what we got planned for you. We think it's exciting. We hope you'll find it exciting. I know that the speakers are exciting, and so it's going to be a good time. So uh, hopefully you'll get to come back and at least hear part of these presentations. <laughs> Suddenly, uh, go back here. There's where I should be. So um, anyway, I'm going to tell you a little bit about careers and better medicine. You know, we as veterinarians, uh, we think of ourselves as your other family doctors. How many of you uh, think of your pets as your parts of your family? Okay, I see almost every hand up. Yeah, you see, uh, they're your four-footed family members. And so when we talk about uh, veterinarians who work on small animals, we really are talking about your other family doctor. And I'm going to try to illustrate this to you a little bit, some with some interesting facts you might uh, find interesting. Uh, you know, in the U.S., 39% of the U.S. households have at least one dog, or 70, over 78 million dogs in the United States, 33% on a cat, and there's over 86 million cats in the United States. Now that may seem a little strange to you that there's actually more cats than there are dogs in the United States. And you know, if you look at the percentages of homes on cats, it's less than the percentage of homes on dogs. But the reason for that is that most people who have cats have multiple cats. Any cat lovers in here? Do you have more than one cat at home? Yeah, that's that's pretty usual, more than one cat. So, um, you know, a lot of us that have dogs only have one dog, but you guys that like cats really well, generally have two, three, or four, five, or six, or if you live on a farm, or in a rural area, you may have dozens. So anyway, and the other reason I think this is true, that there's more cats in the United States than there are dogs, is because a lot of people live in places that aren't like they are in Kansas here. You know, we've got a lot of green space. We've got work with absolutely blessed. Right now, with all the rain and everything, everything's green. And so, uh, you know, there's a lot of people living in this world in places where they have green space to walk their dogs. In fact, I was in New York City some, some years ago. I can tell this story to some uh, folks in this room. But I was going down Fifth Avenue and uh, towards, towards Times Square, actually. I was doing a presentation at the uh, library, New York City Library. 
and so I had a little bit of time to kill. I was saying this, I was walking down the street. Okay, if you had a dog and you lived in New York City on Fifth Avenue, where would you walk that dog? Well, I found out pretty quickly. They actually had a dog park uh, on Fifth Avenue. It's not very big. It's not even as big as this room. And there are signs all over that fence that saying what they do to your dog or to you if your dog did something pretty unruly in that dog park. And so I was saying, though, how hard it must be to take that dog down 30 flights of stairs or 30 flights of uh, go down the elevator, get out on the sidewalk and have to walk down to that dog park every day. But you see, yeah, we can't. You just have a litter pan, a litter box inside, and the cat never really has to leave your apartment. So not everybody gets to live in a great place like we do with a lot of green space where you can walk the dog with the dog's run. Uh, apartment dwellers tend to like cats more. So I think that's part of the reason there's more cats than dogs. Those are members of our families. Let me uh, illustrate this a little bit. We know that two-thirds sleep in their owner's bedrooms. Two-thirds of the dogs in the United States sleep in their owner's bedrooms. Anybody guilty? Yeah. Well, it gets worse than that, actually. Half the dogs in the United States sleep in their owner's beds. Anybody let their dog sleep in their bed? Now, if that doesn't convince you they're part of the family, I don't know what would, actually, because if you're letting that dog sleep in your bed, it's probably part of the family. You know, we don't let our corgi sleep in our bed. In fact, he's got those short legs. He can't get on the bed, thank goodness. But uh, we don't let him sleep in the bed. We wouldn't anyway because corgi shit really bad. And so it'd be like sleeping in a uh, nest of hair if uh, he slept in that bed. So, uh, we don't let him do that. One of the things I do is I collect magazine covers and have pictures of pets. So here's a uh, magazine from the early teens, 19, 17, 18, somewhere through there. And you'll see where the dog is. See the dog's under the bed there? Well, if you go on another decade or two, up into the 20s, 30s, where's that dog that's under the bed? He's beside the bed. And if you uh, look a little further, another 30 or 40 years or so, a few decades, where's that dog go? He goes from under the bed, beside the bed, on the bed. And look where he's at now. He's under the covers. <laughs> See, even magazine covers illustrate this. And you can follow this through the decades. Isn't that pretty exciting? So you see, dogs have gone from being on outside the house, onto the front porch, into the living room, into the bedroom, onto the bed, and under the covers. So I think they really are part of our family, if you think of them that way, and the, how we treat them. So, uh, and our Corey is part of our family. He doesn't get to sleep in the bed, as I said earlier. But he's certainly part of the family. Uh, we do anything for him. In fact, we just had two teeth pulled recently. Uh, he's 11 years old. And so uh, I took him in to have his teeth cleaned. And uh, the veterinary dentist told me, well, we really need to pull these two teeth. They're not uh, teeth that we can save. We should save. And so, uh, you know, he was kind of moping around. We knew that he was, in fact, he was throwing his food on the floor. We, we feed him dry dog food. And he'd grab a big bite of that, and then he'd flop his head and throw that food all over the floor, and then he'd go around and pick it up. And we knew something was really strange, because usually he's a very aggressive eater. Usually he knows which cupboard, which cabinet in the kitchen has dog food in it. And so when I go over there, he's right up there, and I start to I open up the bin to get his dog food out. He's there just as soon as I get the put it in his bowl. He's eating. Well, there for a while, he was... Uh, Pretty reluctant to eat, and he, like I said, he was throwing food all over the place. So that's one of the reasons I took him in, and lo and behold, he did have two bad teeth. And so now, back to normal again. And uh, he's eating normally, very, very aggressive about his eating, so it really hurt him. A couple of other facts you might be interested in 93% of water body presents for the dogs. You ever buy your dog a present? Yeah, most of you have. 27% of water is have good dogs in their wills. Now, you guys are much too young to be worrying about those sorts of things. The people with hair my color, we worry about what's going to happen to our dogs when we're gone. And you know that we know that a lot of older people don't buy dogs uh, after their dogs die because they're afraid that they will, the dogs will outlive them. And then who's going to take care of that dog once they're gone? So we have programs now where uh, you can actually make a donation. To, uh, Kansas State's an example, Kansas State University. And if you make a donation and uh, set this all up, before uh, you know you pass away, then when you do pass away, when the older person passes away, then um, someone there will be there to take care of the dog. Usually, we adopt those dogs out to a student, and the student gets a free food for the dog, the life of the dog, free medical care, and free um, everything. And it's all paid for. That all we have to do is just find a loving home for that family. So you know we're finding more old, old, older owners now putting their dogs into wills with stipulations like this that uh, somebody will take care of their animal. Because, you know, if you're adopting a dog, you're talking about a 12, 15, maybe 20-year commitment. 
my uh, son's dog just died last week. We haven't much sleep. He lives here uh, uh, on Lake. And uh, late Wednesday evening, I came up to Blue Pearl. And uh, the dog hit the 17 and a half. And uh, they called me and said, you know, would you, uh, I was happy to be in town. I was at K-State Celebrates. I don't think of your K-State Celebrates last Wednesday night. Down at, I mean, I like the Roman Park, where it is down there. But anyway, uh, they knew I was in town, so they said, would you come with the dog? And I did. And, you know, there was just, the dog had been going down the hill, and it was time. But, uh, you know, I just say that story to say, you know, they lived for a long time, seven years, half years, I thought. 37% of owners talk to their dogs on the phone. Do you ever call your dog on the phone? <laughs> do they ever answer back? Oh, do you call your dog? Oh, no, surely not. But he does talk on the phone. Oh, well, you know, the only dog I know that talks is uh, Charlie. Is that, is it what's the name of that dog? And dog in the block? Dog in the block? Dog with a block. With a block, yeah. You guys know Disney World and stuff. Or Disney World. Yeah, see, I've got a 10-year-old granddaughter, too, so I know a little bit about that stuff. But uh, there's really older people. The only uh, animals that we knew that talked uh, was Mr. Ed. He was a horse. And, uh, yeah, he talked. But, uh, you know, the only animals that talked. 78% so of owners, 78% of owners allow dogs to lick their faces. Now, I can tell you the better we do not recommend this. You know, there's a lot of people that will tell you dogs' mouths are cleaner than your mouth. Um, it isn't true. Absolutely. I hope it's not true, at least. Uh, but, uh, have you ever watched where a dog licks? Have you ever watched what dogs eat? Uh, just think about that the next time. You're thinking about letting that dog lick you in the face. Uh -uh. My dog's not going to lick me in the face. I can help it. So uh, we don't recommend that. 29% of owners dress your dogs in clothes. We're going to Halloween here pretty quick. And probably some of you will buy Halloween clothes for your dogs. Uh, some of you probably take your dogs trick-or-treating if you still go trick-or-treating. Uh, you know, so, uh, yeah. And even at 1600 Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C., uh, the Obama family, they have a dog. Here's a picture of Bo. He's a Portuguese water dog when he was a puppy. Of course, he's grown up now. And they have a second one called Sonny. And, you know, most of our U.S. presidents have had dogs because they realize that most of us have dogs or cats, and they realize that that makes them seem more human. Uh, in fact, I'm absolutely convinced that if Obama wanted his, and President Obama wanted his ratings to be higher, he would see more of Bo and Sonny. Uh, because uh, other presidents have taken advantage of these photo ops. Back when George W. Bush was president, we used to see his dogs all the time. Every time he got off the airplane, uh, we saw his dogs out there at the airplane, the helicopter was meeting him. Uh, when uh, Clinton was president, President Clinton, way back when, uh, he had a cat in socks, and uh, we saw socks all the time. Uh, in fact, I knew somebody who worked at the White House and asked him about socks during the Clinton era. And they said, and uh, Buddy, his chocolate lab, and I asked him about those, and they said, you know, uh, the Clinton's use those for photo ops. And whenever Clinton's helicopter would land, he always would get the leash from Buddy, and then as soon as he got to the White House door, he'd hand the leash to the kennel uh, operator in the basement of the White House, and that's where the dog stayed until they needed another photo op. It's kind of sad, actually, but on the other hand, they knew the power of having uh, animals in their lives as it relates to us. So, uh, the, the candidates that are running right now are Trump and uh, Hillary Clinton. Uh, you know, I, in my opinion, if they ask me, I'd say, get your dogs and cats out there. Let us see them. Let us see that you're human. Let us see that you're just like us, that you love these animals. So, uh, you know, we, uh, when, the Obama, when President Obama was elected, he had promised his daughters that as soon as he got elected, they could get a dog. Well, we all waited anxiously with a great amount of uh, anticipation and wondered what they would get. They talked about getting a pound dog or rescuing a dog, which would have been absolutely great. But one of the girls has an allergy, and so they ended up getting a Portuguese water dog, which sheds less, so there's less allergy problems. So anyway, this is a picture of Bowling. Quite so. so anyway, that's kind of, uh, I hope you have convinced you that animals really are part of our families. If you weren't already convinced, at least you've got some trivia now that you go home and talk about, think about, uh, support your, your view that maybe they're part of the family. Private clinical practicing veterinarians, 66% of the veterinarians in the United States are private, uh, clinical, in private clinical practice. And I've listed here kind of where they're at. Uh, of course, the predominant uh, is small animal explosive practice, which you'd expect to find in a fairly large city or larger uh, metropolitan area where you take your dog or cat and treat it. Uh, that's what most people, most veterinarians do. You'll see uh, there's few uh, veterinarians are in mixed animal practice. And uh, there's only about 100,000 veterinarians in the United States total. So 
That may seem like a huge number to you. It may seem like a small number. I can tell you it's relatively small compared to the other professions in the United States. If you think about uh, the legal profession or human medicine or any of the other professions, they're really pretty small profession. So only about 8% are in an example practice. These are people that generally uh, practice in rural areas. And there's a huge shortage of veterinarians in rural areas. So it's rural Kansas, rural Nebraska, rural, whatever you want to talk about, there's a shortage of veterinarians. And these are individuals who have to do absolutely everything because they might have someone bring in an animal that uh, they don't particularly want to work on or they don't have the expertise to work on. And whereas in a larger metropolitan area, so the veterinarian might say, well, just take your animal on to the next veterinarian, which might be just down to the next street corner or a mile or so down the road. These people can't say that because the next veterinarian might be two or 300 bucks down the road. And so they have to know something about everything. So I greatly admire these people because they truly have to work on everything. Large animal predominant and uh, mixed animal people that work on food animals. Again, a relatively small number taking care of our food supply. How many of you worried about the safety of your food when you ate this morning for breakfast? Oh, you worried about it? Oh, no. See, I ask uh, younger children that a lot of times, and all the hands go up. Oh, yeah, they're trying to kill us at the school cafeteria, you know, <laughs> with this poison food. But, you know, we're so blessed to live in the United States where food really is safe. Oh, yeah, we have outbreaks of E. coli and things like that occasionally. But, uh, you know, generally our food is pretty safe. And so you really don't have to worry too much when you go out to a restaurant or somewhere at home or where you might be eating about whether the food is safe or not. So that's because we have great uh, veterinarians and we have uh, great producers of uh, food supply, and they're all trying to put out a very safe product. Equine. Uh, there's a relatively small group of people that take care of horses, and then, of course, others, including exotics. Down here in this picture, you'll see this is a tiger. If you can't see it from the back, it's a tiger in our dental room. Uh, that's a tiger from our local zoo. We have a zoo in Manhattan, Kansas. It's AZA accredited, which means that it's in the top 10% of all zoos throughout the United States, standards-wise. And so we have a really good exotic animal medicine program. In fact, we have a uh, veterinary facility out at the zoo. And so a lot of things we take care of out there, but uh, something like this, uh, they want to bring in. So can you imagine driving across Manhattan, Kansas, in a van with an anesthetized tiger in the back? Uh, yeah, that's what they did. They anesthetized the tiger at the zoo, then put him in the back of the van and drove him both across town to the veterinary hospital and did these dental procedures, then took him back anesthetized. Uh, I can't imagine uh, you know, driving a van with an anesthetized tiger in the back. In fact, I did some consultant at St. Louis many years ago. And one of the things I worked on was polar bear. And in the polar bear pits behind the polar bear display at St. Louis Zoo, they only had, uh, it was very limited, you could touch both walls, touch the ceiling. And so they nested that big old polar bear back there. And somebody said, were you scared? And I said, well, not really, not as long as I, the anesthesiologist was between me and the bear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because I figured, well, the bear was nibbling on him, I was running. And so, you know, but uh, anyway, uh, we do a lot of exotics, and so if any of you are interested in exotics, uh, we have one of the best exotic animal medicine programs in the world. Uh, just real quick stories for you. We, the, some of you know that we had some pandas born at the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. several months ago. It was a K-State veterinarian that took care of those pandas. Uh, she did an externship in China while she was our student and uh, learned about pandas. She went back to China after she graduated and learned more about pandas, and now she's a staff veterinarian for the Smithsonian or the National Zoo in Washington, D.C. The lead veterinarian, the head veterinarian at the Atlanta Zoo in Georgia is a Kansas State veterinarian. So uh, we're pretty proud of uh, the fact that we've got a really good exotic animal medicine program. So anyway, that, uh, that's what 100% of the private clinical practice of veterinarians are, uh, basically. And then the other 24%, if you look at, uh, I think it's 66 or 100%, they're in academia, they're in federal and state government, uniform services industry and others. So one of the points I want to make today is, that there are so many things you can do as a veterinarian. We all think of traditional practice. There's nothing wrong with traditional practice. We need traditional practitioners. But there's so many other things you can do. In fact, was I, when I was in veterinary school, I never thought I'd be doing what I'm doing today. I never thought I'd be standing in front of you talking. And so I went into private practice at the state of Ohio after graduating from veterinary school. Worked on dairy cows mostly. They're my favorite, actually, the dairy cows are. Uh, but I worked on horses, a lot of horses, a lot of small animals as well. And there I went to the University of Missouri for 10 years. But I'd be there for just two or three years to become board certified theriogenologist. Does anybody know what a theriogenologist is? That's the person that does obstetrics and gynecology for animals. So I love to deliver babies, whether they're foals, puppies, kittens, whatever it might be, uh, calves. Uh, every birth is a miracle, and to be there is absolutely an amazing thing. 
And so, um, so I went there thinking that I was going to learn how to be the regionologist. And then I go back to private practice. Well, I ended up staying there 10 years. Got an the faculty position, stayed on there, stayed for 10 years. For C section, I did have a dog as a veterinarian after graduation. It was a basset hound with 16 puppies. Um, can you imagine a long basset hound? Anybody in here got a basset hound? These, they're long, long body animals with short legs, 16 puppies. I mean, that poor girl was in miserable shape. And so uh, we sent 15 home the next morning uh, in good shape. I did the, the surgery late one night and sent the, the, her home with 15 live, viable puppies the next morning. One little puppy was born as a runt, couldn't make it through the night. But even 15 puppies was a lot of mom to take care of. So to me, that's exciting. I mean, uh, if you're called out to deliver a cap or deliver a pole, deliver whatever, holy cow, how does it get more exciting than that? So anyway, there's about 5,000 of us in academia. There's about 5,000 of us that teach at veterinary schools, do research at veterinary schools, we're administration, all kinds of things. And so if any of you are interested in finding a degree uh, or a career in teaching, working with students and medicine and working with animals and all those sorts of things, this might be the place for you. In fact, when I was uh, in pre vet my advisor called me one day and he said, so Ronnie, what do you want to do with your life? And I said, oh, I don't know. I kind of like going to school. College is okay. You know, there's nothing wrong with being a college student for a good while. And he said, no, no, you've got it wrong. You've got to graduate sometime. You've got to go on and be productive. And so I started thinking about all the things I was interested in. And I was interested in so many different things, uh, animals, and medicine, uh, science, and uh, you know, all kinds of things. And so veterinary medicine brought them all together for me. So I'll tell you that story about where I've been just because uh, a lot of people don't think about academia. And you see, I've got white hair. There's a lot of us that have white hair that are dying and leaving the profession because of retiring. We need replacements. There may be a dean of a veterinary school sitting here right now. There may be, uh, you know, I, I was telling the story one time, I got carried away and I said, you know, some of you may work on the president's dog someday. But do you know that one of my former students, Larry Nate, down in Arkansas worked on socks, President Clinton's cat, and, you know, it came true. You know, he really did work on a president's animal. You guys might do the same thing. So, uh, sky's the limit. Federal state government, there's lots of positions in federal state governments and regulatory agencies, and food safety, and uh, bioterrorism, all that sort of stuff. We have about uh, 750 veterinarians in the military, most of in the Army, and so great, great careers. We have about 11 or 12 students in our program right now that are in the military. Veterinary students that are in the military get full ride scholarships, which means they get all their tuition paid, all their uh, living expenses paid, they get a living stipend, they get all their books and equipment paid for, all they have to do is pay four years back to the Army after they graduate, and all this paid for. Absolutely no uh, did I borrow any money to go to school. It's a great way to go to school. Uh, industry, uh, we're in the animal health quarter. There's over 120 animal health companies between Columbia, Missouri, Manhattan, Kansas, along here, State 70. And if you draw lines up to St. Joe, Missouri, which, of course, is our Kansas City here, uh, within that train right now, there's over 120 animal health companies. You think about Hills Pet Nutrition, say, uh, Bear, or Zoetis, Pfizer, uh, animals like, uh, companies like that, they have a lot of veterinarians. Some of you may be interested in doing something like that. And then, of course, a lot of other things. In fact, I was telling some students the other day, we've had veterinarians on space shuttles. And so I said to them, you know, one of you in this group may go to the moon someday. Well, in that group that I was talking to, the uh, one student said, I don't want to go to the moon. And I said, well, you don't have to. But there's so many things out there we haven't even thought about that veterinarians are going to be doing in the future that, you know, if you're interested in veterinary medicine and you get a veterinary degree, and you prepare yourself to step through those doors as opportunities open. Uh, you know, there's just great things out there that you probably haven't thought about, that I haven't thought about, that we don't even know to think about. And so uh, this is where the other 24% are. Well, there's special areas of veterinary medicine. There's about 21 special areas recognized by the American Veterinary Medical Association. You see them listed here, so you can become a board-certified surgeon, internal medicine person, uh, dermatologist, ophthalmologist. We call those zoologists. And so if you're interested in becoming a board-certified specialist in a particular area, then certainly they're it's just like a human mess. You sometimes might, or sometimes some of you have been referred to an orthopedic surgeon or to a neurologist or dermatologist or whatever. In human medicine, we have the same thing in veterinary medicine. And you can see they make a pretty good salary, uh, which is like people. Right now, I tell you, there's a huge shortage of veterinary radiologists, huge shortage of cardiologists, a huge shortage of a number of these ologies, if you will. And so uh, if you're interested in any of those sorts of uh, areas, uh, Certainly, that's something to think about down the road. 
Welcome to Michigan, the Dairy Branding College in the United States. Uh, we're the sixth oldest. We started in 1905, so we're a little over 110 years old. So we've been producing competent veterinarians that are literally located around the world for over 110 years. So we're very proud of that heritage. So if you come to Kansas State University to go to veterinary school, you will be joining a very large family of veterinarians. And these, uh, what this means, too, is that we have a very large alumni base which is very supportive in terms of scholarship money, in terms of uh, providing externships, mentorships, jobs after graduation, all that kind of stuff. So uh, we're, we're very proud of our uh, long heritage. So our curriculum is four years in length. All the uh, veterinary schools, all 30 veterinary schools throughout the United States have four-year curriculums. And so uh, what you do is you do your pre-vet work, and those courses that you have to do as pre-veterinary students we're going to listen to the back of this sheet here. Hopefully, uh, if you haven't already, you'll pick one of these up before you leave. Whoops. Right back here, there are 64 hours of pre-vet requirements listed. Those are undergraduate courses, and so you'll take those before you go to veterinary school. Complete those, and then you go to veterinary school. So, a veterinarian has, on the average, just seven to eight years of college before they graduate. And so, you know, that seems like a long time. I know from your vantage point, looking ahead, I think about seven to eight years of school, Oh my goodness, you just like to get out of high school now or going through school and not think about another seven or eight years. But, you know, it's really a fairly short period of time compared to a lifetime uh, occupation or career. And as you look back, it'll seem shorter and shorter. And so, um, you know, we hope that you'll be doing stuff that you enjoy. That, you know, that seven or eight years won't scare you off. So the four years are divided up in, uh, in this way at K State. Four years after completion of the prerequisites, the first year is normal form and function, so you'll know, learn about the all the domestic species, that's dog, cat, cow, horse, sheep, goat, pig. Um, we want you to get a very broad-based for educational experience. That doesn't mean you have to have experience with all those animals before you come to us, but you'll get experience while you're there. So we want you to have a very broad-based for educational experience encompassing all the domestic species so that you can build on the foundation that you get at K-State and anything the brain medicine has to offer. We don't want you to be limited by your uh, education at K-State. Another reason for requiring you to learn about all the domestic species is that when you get ready to get licensed to practice veterinary medicine in Kansas or any other state, you're going to have to know about all these domestic species. And so, uh, you know, there's some schools that allow tracking. What they mean by that is that you can tell them, I'm only going to do small animal work, I'm only going to do horse work, I'm only going to do cattle work, or whatever it might be. And so you'll get extra of that and exclude the stuff that you tell them that you're not going to do. Well, the problem is that most of us, I shouldn't say most of us, a lot of us in veterinary medicine have changed our minds. Like I said earlier, I never imagined that I would be an academic when I was in veterinary school. I thought I'd go back to uh, Southern Illinois, that's where I grew up, practice there for 40 or 50 years, uh, retire, and that would have been an absolutely wonderful career. But you know, doors and opportunities came along. You know, I've lived in five states now, been all over the country, all over the world. And so uh, you want to be prepared to do all those sorts of things. So uh, anyway, first year of normal form function, encompassing all the domestic species, and you'll have the opportunity for electives, so you can emphasize the area that you're most interested in, and you can uh, do your addition exotics, you can do your electives and exotics. So here's abnormal form and function, so now you're studying about how bacteria, trauma, uh, viruses, etc., affect the body, and what's the body's response. So pathology, if you will. And so um, you learn the normal, because if you don't know what normal looks like, you won't recognize abnormal. Now you're studying about, okay, what made those animals abnormal, and, uh, you know, how do we uh, determine what, what the cause of the problem was. Then your third year of preclinical uh, courses taught still in a, uh, your clinical courses taught in a preclinical setting. So now you're doing your first stage, your first neuters, uh, your first surgeries, you're doing uh, radiology, anesthesiology, all those neat things. So you're actually learning some of those skills uh, that you need based upon what you've already learned and you're adding to that. Uh, so um, you know, the, this year's the final year because you're now getting closer and closer to clinics. Then the fourth year is a clinical, is a full calendar year and it's clinical. It's in our veterinary medicine teaching hospital. And so now you're applying everything you've learned in the first three years, plus you're learning a whole heck of a lot more. Um, to actual cases. These are cases owned by people, by owners. They're actually uh, disease that occurred in the natural state. And so now you're actually uh, applying everything that you know. So as I said earlier, it kind of builds on itself and you, you graduate with a lot of clinical skills as well as a lot of knowledge. So I might just mention to you real quick that on an actual board examination, our students 
uh, pass a passing rate of 99 percent each year. They got for some years now, and what that means is that for at every graduation, there's usually like one student walking across the stage getting their diploma that hasn't passed their national boards to be licensed, and that student usually passes the next time the exam is given because they realize that practicing veterinary medicine, you have to have a license, and so they need to get real serious about taking that exam. So we have a very high passage rate. So our admissions committee has a mission statement, and this is actually printed on your uh, the sheet here as well. And so I'm always being asked, so what kind of students are you looking for? What kind of applicants are you looking for? Well, these are the things that we're looking for. There's nine things listed here. And so as you're in high school, think about how you're going to be uh, we're trying to convince the committee that you have all these characteristics. Strong desire to be a veterinarian, obviously, is the first thing. You know, a lot of people would say, so why would you apply to veterinary school if, you're not, if you don't want to be a veterinarian? And so why do you have that strong desire? Well, you know, it's a pretty tough um, educational experience. And, and, you know, you're getting worn out. You're going to get tired. You're going to get grumpy. Now, there'll be days that you'll say, I don't know if I want to do this or not. But you need to have that inner gut desire to be successful so that you'll make it through the uh, study veterinary medicine, get your degree, get your license, and then uh, enjoy your career. So, you know, we want people in there that really want to do this. So one thing that you need to be doing now is you need to be shadowing veterinarians. You need to be working with veterinarians if you can. Uh, you know, if you can shadow a veterinarian, that's great. But if you can get paid for working for a veterinarian, that's even greater. Uh, but, you know, you just need to get enough experience that you really know what you're getting into, that you really want to do this, to develop that strong inner uh, feeling that this is what I want to do. Compassion for people and animals is really important, respect for all life. You know, I often ask students that are interested in veterinary medicine, so have you explored being a human doctor? Have you explored being a nurse? Have you explored being a pharmacist, a uh, physician's assistant? You know, whatever it might be, because, you know, again, you really want to know that this is what you're going to do. And, you know, the answer to the question I usually get when I ask that question is, well, yes, I have explored all those things, but I really don't like people. And I know he's kind of smile and chuckle because I understand what they're saying, but you know you really do have black people. Uh, every animal that I've ever worked on, with the exception of orphan kittens, left in a cardboard box on the doorstep of our clinic after dark uh, by somebody, we didn't know who, uh, but whoever left those kittens, everybody, every other animal I've ever worked on has had a human being attached to them. It was a human being that called me to come to their farm to deliver that cap or pole or whatever it might be or is somebody at the other end of the leash, or somebody carrying a cat cage, or whatever it might be. There's humans to work with. And so, uh, so you have to have a compassion for people as well as animals. Personal integrity and high ethical standards are really important. You're going to have a lot of confidential information. You're going to be helping people make decisions about their family members, about their uh, production units, and all these sorts of things. Strong written and oral communication skills are important. Obviously, you have to be able to communicate. Um, problem solving critical thinking skills. I don't know if you ever thought about it, but any help career that you might be thinking about. It's all about problem solving for problem preventing. In fact, I got an email today from uh, from our, uh, one of our administrative assistants saying we're going to have a flu shot uh, clinic at the veterinary school here in a couple couple days. And you know, if you haven't got your flu shot, come on down. Well, I was trying to get my flu shot before Thanksgiving because I know that at Thanksgiving, all of our students are going to go home, 24,000 of them from the university. They're going to bring back all the bugs that they've encountered at home. And I want to have my immunity build up before they all come back. And we have the other rule of our house is that if you get the flu and you've had a flu shot, well, then my wife's going to take care of it. But if I get the flu and I haven't had a flu shot, then she says, buddy, you're on your own. <laughs> so, see, uh, it's good to get that flu shot. So if you should have to get the flu, yeah, I've got somebody that's going to take care of it. But anyway, she's just joking, of course. She takes care of you no matter what, I think. <laughs> so, but anyway, uh, uh, the, that's that's prevention. So I have an absolutely wonderful doctor, a wonderful dentist, um, you know, wonderful healthcare team. But I never go to see them unless I'm trying to solve a problem or prevent a problem. Prevent a problem by getting a flu shot. Solve a problem because I've got something wrong with me. and I want to know what it is. Let's get it fixed. And so uh, you know, uh, and that's why it's better mess. They're not going to call you unless they've got a problem or they're trying to prevent a problem. In fact, I tell my students all the time: you get a skewed view of the world. Because all you see are animal animals. You don't see the ones that are normal. They don't call you to come out and watch that cow calf. It's having a calf on her own uh, without any problems. They call you on the one that has a really tremendous problem. And then, so you get kind of a skewed view of what's going on in the real world. The uh, so problem solving is really important. Commitment to better a community, once community, society, uh, 
profession are really important. So what we mean by this is community service. Right now you can be volunteering within your community, help volunteering through school activities, church activities, civic activities, whatever it might be. Being a professional is all about serving society. And so you need to develop this habit now if you don't already have it. I'll bet you already have it. But, you know, it could be uh, working as a uh, volunteering community society, community shelter. It could be reading books to kids' library. It could be helping seniors at the senior center. It could be giving blood. It could be just doing anything. It's something that says, I care. I care about the people around me. I want this to be a better world. I truly do. And so uh, our community is going to be looking for people that have volunteered. So uh, you want to build a resume that has uh, some volunteers in mind. Understanding of the world and its culture is really important. You know, right now, we're, uh, Zika virus is really important to us. Uh, we know that came from Brazil or down South America. And so it's really important that you know what's going on in terms of, of the rest of the world. But several years ago, we had a foot mouth outbreak in England. It's important that veterans of the U.S. know what's going on over in England. It's important that they know about uh, BSC in Canada. It's important that they know about all these things because they can easily get to the United States very quickly. So... Um, we want someone, we want people to know about the world and its cultures. So that strong academic ability is a given. You need to be uh, strong in sciences. And when we mean strong academic ability, what we mean is that you need to make most of these and these. You don't have to be straight A, but if you're straight A, that's okay. There's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I'm often asked by students, so what should I shoot for grade-wise? And I always smile and say, shoot for your very best. I mean, if you're a straight A student, go for it. If you're not, it's okay too. But uh, shoot for your very best. And as long as you're done your very best work, uh, you'll, you'll be satisfied with yourself and you'll have a satisfying career. So, you know, do your very best. But generally speaking, in better school, you need to have mostly A's and B's. So it's like a B plus average. And you all are in a great uh, spot right now because you still have clean slates. And so you can uh, determine that you're going to have a really good, uh, strong uh, uh, application when it comes to time. Current uh, commitment to lifelong learning. We can't begin to teach you what in four years what you need for a 40-year career. So you have to be inquisitive. You have to be uh, someone who's very observant. You have to be constantly learning new stuff. And we'll help you do that. Uh, we have a uh, computer program. All of our notes are delivered electronically. All of our students get computers the first day they're with us. Uh, their tablets, or their convertible tablets, so they can write on all these class notes. They can highlight and do all that stuff. Then you have all the PowerPoint presentations right from them. During class time, and so we're, we want to teach them how to access information, how to use information, because they can't learn in four years all that they need in four year career. So those are things to think about. Whoops, let me back up here. These are those programs that I talked about earlier. You'll see oral and written communication skills at the top here. There's 35 hours of science courses here from general chemistry to adaptive genetics, social sciences, humanities. Those are things like psychology, sociology, philosophy, uh, foreign languages, history, geography. Business courses, economics courses, all those kinds of courses. Those are courses designed to make you a better rounded person, someone who knows how to live in the world, someone that knows how to get along with people, somebody that knows something about culture, all those sorts of things. And then like these can be absolutely anything. If any of you have questions about any of our prereqs, I'll be glad to answer those after you now. We're going to skip over this. This is about the application. We rank our students based upon the graduate direct exam scores. Those are like the ACT scores, only for college too. So whatever you get ready to find better still. You'll be taking the GRE. We look at your science grades, 35 hours of science prerequisites are particularly important. And then we look at animal experience, learning experience, life experiences, letters of reference, that's your critical activities, interview, and all that stuff. So these are things that uh, you kind of keep like, kind of need to keep in mind as you finish high school and move on into college. One of the things I constantly tell students is that I'm a firm believer that you should have a very robust high school experience and a very robust college experience. And what I mean by that is take advantage of everything you can while you're in high school. Learn all the math you can, take all the math courses, all the science courses, business courses, communications courses. If any of you like Spanish, if you're really good at Spanish, take Spanish courses. If you're not good, that's okay too. Uh, don't take them. Don't torture yourself. But uh, we get a lot of calls for Spanish-speaking veterinarians. In fact, we have a lecky in our program now for uh, veterinarians to learn Spanish, particularly medical terms, uh, because we have so many... Uh, farms and so many places where uh, the people that are taking care of the animals speak Spanish. So, you know, if it's something that comes easy for you, if you really like to do it, go for it. If you uh, if you don't, like I said, don't torture yourself to take Spanish. It's not a requirement. Another thing I'm often asked about is international travel. Uh, if you like to do that, if you have the opportunity to do it, sure, go. Go do it. Uh, get out of your comfort zone. Uh, find out how other cultures 
live, how they do things. And, uh, you know, those other things that apply it to your uh, application if you're, if you're interested. The current class, the first year class of 2020, these are their characteristics, uh, just statistics. People are always asking me. Uh, so what about the first year class? What's it look like? Well, there's 112 students. Uh, there's only 15 students that are male students, 27 students are female. So the gender shift started back in the late 80s, early 90s, and uh, it's really, uh, the pendulum is really small. It'll swing back eventually, but uh, this is where we're at right now. And you know, of course, we don't discriminate based upon gender, or sex, or age, or any of those sorts of things, but people always ask, so you know, uh, we put the statistics together. Ages, you see here, uh, we have one student that was 20 years old when she started grade school back in August, and we had six that were 30 plus. We had a unique situation a year ago where we had a graduating senior whose daughter was in the first year class. I figured that one out. Uh, Mama was probably in her 50s, and daughter was uh, somewhere in her 20s. So, um, you yeah, know, that's kind of unique. So, um, but anyway, age is just not a factor. Average age is 22.4. So that's uh, by the time they get into the prereqs and uh, in the end of middle school. Where do they come from? Well, we take 112 new students each year. And so those 112 students, uh, 45 approximately are from Kansas, 67 are from everywhere else. We have a contract with the state of North Dakota, so we take up five students from the state of North Dakota because they don't have a better school. The state of North Dakota pays a difference in state and out-of-state tuition, those sorts of things. And we take international students. So you see in this class we have two from China. So you can kind of get an idea there where, where all the students came from. 24 states are represented. Average size GPA is 3.3, so that's why I was telling you that 4.0 is a straight A, 3.3 is a B plus, and so mostly A's and B's. That doesn't mean that you can't get a C if you've got an A to bring that up to a B. Uh, but you know, you really want to start, particularly your science courses, because ours is a science-based curriculum. And so uh, you're going to be expected to know uh, your science courses. Granted record exams, you can see the percentiles here, and then uh, we do not require a bachelor's degree before you start veterinary school. We just require that you have those prerequisites done. And so uh, there's actually 22 of our students in that first year class that do not have uh, any degrees, and some have master's degrees or we use as PhDs and usually have uh, some professional people in there as well. Uh, we have, there's a lot of uh, lawyers that come to veterinary school, they combine the two degrees, uh, that sort of thing. So. So the US Bureau, U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics says this about veterinary medicine. And, you know, depending on who you talk to, depending on which veterinarian you talk to, they may tell you that there's enough veterinarians in the world, and they may tell you there's not enough. You know, if they're looking for a new employee and they can't find one, there's not enough. If uh, there's three veterinary clinics on their street corner, there's too many. So, you know, it just kind of depends. What I think the truth is that there's probably a maldistribution of veterinarians across the United States. And I can tell you that I've been in this business for over 27 years. Well, I'm going to my 27th year now. And it was never had a year yet that we couldn't find a good position for every graduate that wanted a position if they were willing to travel. Now, if you tell me that you've got to be on a certain street corner in Overland Park, Kansas, or Olathe, or wherever it might be, I might say, look around. There's already three practices on that corner. It's probably not going to work. But if um, you're willing to go where the work is, where, where they need you, there's a good job out there for you. The U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics is saying that uh, the need for veterinarians is going to increase by 33% over the next decade, much faster than the average for all occupations. What they base this on is the fact that uh, there are only 30 veterinary colleges in the United States. They're all, they all have room enrollment, so they know how many veterinarians are graduating from these three veterinary colleges. They know how many of us are uh, retiring and dying off. They know how strong the human animal bond is. They know that, in fact, uh, pets are part of your family, that you're willing to pay for good diagnostics, good uh, medical treatment, or good surgical treatment, or whatever it might be. And so uh, we know that that human animal bond is getting stronger and stronger, and so uh, that bodes well for veterinarians. They know that we need more veterinarians for public health, food safety, national disease control programs, biomedical research, homeland security. You know, they're building the National Animal, uh, national Bio and Agro Defense Facility in Bath, right next to the veterinary school, Kansas State University. That's a billion dollar building. Billion with a B. You know, I say B because I don't know what a billion dollars looks like. I mean, that's a lot of money. It's the largest economic uh, development ever in Kansas. And so uh, it's going to take them to 2020 just to get that building done. Uh, I can see it out the windows from the veterinary school. 
that we're kind of right now, and it's going to employ three or four hundred people. A lot of those are going to be veterinarians. It's extremely high security. It's a facility designed for research infectious diseases for which there is no cure in animals. And so foot and mouth disease and things like that will be researched in that facility. It's very, very secure. Big fence around it already, just the building site. In fact, I was taking a picture of the sign in front of it the other day, and some security guy came out and said, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, I saw a picture of the sign. So he, he said, well, that's all, you, all I want you to do. Just get a picture of your sign and get out of here. And uh, so, uh, you know, security is already pretty tight. But uh, if you uh, were sinus in that facility, you would have to go through a locker room on the way to the lab, take all your clothes off, take a shower, put on laboratory clothes, go in and do your work, and do the reverse on the way out so that you don't carry anything out with you. So 2020, they're expecting to have the building done. It's going to take another three years to commission the building, which means they're going to be checking all the systems to make sure absolutely nothing leaks through the air or leaks through the sewage or anything like that. And then they'll finally start doing research in that building. So you guys are well suited time-wise. If you're interested in doing a research career or working for InBab or working for some company in the animal health quarter, uh, you know, become a veterinarian. It's about the right time to start filling those positions. So we're pretty excited about that. So we think that this is all based upon all these things. It's going to be a huge need, vet, need for veterinarians in all sectors. And so, um, you know, I'd, I'd like for you to think about that as you think about that. That's, well, this is a picture of our facilities, and uh, there is a rainbow over our facilities. There's a pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. You all know that. And so it's my job to help you find that pot of gold, that pot of gold being your career. And, you know, we want you to come be veterinarians, join our family of veterinarians, and to have a very, very productive, very, very happy uh, veterinary career, uh, enjoying the serving the people that you serve in your communities and wherever you might be. You know, I was in private practice quite a few years ago, as I mentioned to you earlier. And I still remember my clients very, very well. I still think about them, realizing that, oh, they've all changed now, of course. A lot of them have passed away. A lot of them, their children, they have grandchildren. And, you know, it's totally different. But that snapshot, I still think about all the wonderful experiences I had. And I tell the students all the time, I used to do a lot of emergency work. And I get called out at 2 o'clock in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning, to go deliver a cab on a cold, wet night when the wind's blowing, it's raining, you know, it's just awful. You're driving out there and you're thinking, oh my goodness, how awful could it be? Why did they call me at 2 o'clock? There's three other veterinarians in the area they could have called, but now they had to call me, you know, just kind of grumpy and all that sort of stuff. But I can tell you that every time I ever went on one of those calls, I never came back to town feeling grumpy. I was always happy because I knew that I'd help the person. Uh, if, if I couldn't help the animal, at least it made the person feel better. And, you know, it was absolutely a wonderful experience. And I think about those experiences every day uh, now, the experiences I had when I was back in practice. So I've rambled on about a lot of things. Do you have any questions or anything, anything that you'd like to know about veterinary medicine or about veterinary education, anything that I uh, haven't covered? Yes, ma'am. Um, I think I read somewhere that if you're, like, if you're getting a degree in, like, biology and you go to vet school after three years, you can get it, like, after one year in vet school. Right. Okay, so the question was if you uh, get a degree through biology or arts and sciences, biology, chemistry, physics, those sorts of things, that actually also applies to if you go to this college bay at K-State and get a degree in animal science or egg journalism or something along those lines. You can do your three years of pre-vet, and then you can come to very school and get your bachelor's degree from the College of Agriculture or the College of Arts and Sciences by applying a year of veterinary school back to that bachelor's degree. So, for example, the other day, well, the other day, the other day, a year ago, time flies when you get white hair, but um, anyway, um, last year a student came in to me, a senior student, she said, I'd like to get my College, college of Agriculture because I did my pre-vet work there. And so I said, well, you need to go to the College of Agriculture, the Dean's office, and ask them, you know, how you do that. Um, you know, make sure you got all the courses and everything. And so she came back to me and I said, what did they tell you? She said, they said I'm two humanities courses short. And I said, well, it doesn't mean you can't get your bachelor's degree. Just take those two humanities courses and graduate with your bachelor's degree, and you'll get your veterinary degree as well. Um, but it would have been nicer if she'd done that ahead of time. So my advice always is work with your pre-vet advisors. They have great pre-vet advisors in the College of Ag and the College of Arts and Sciences. And, you know, have all that taken care of before you get to veterinary school so that you can get your bachelor's degree after you've been very school for a year. So, yes, the, the deadline. So, absolutely. Uh, I've got two bachelor's degrees. Um, I didn't plan on getting any. Um, but uh, I went to the University of Illinois. 
And so my uh, college that I did my pre-med work at gave me a bachelor's degree after the first year of veterinary school, same sort of thing. And then uh, at that time, uh, University of Illinois gave everybody in veterinary school a bachelor's degree after they finished two years. So I got a second bachelor's degree. So other questions? Great question. Dr. Armour, we have a question from Blue Valley Cabs. Oh, no, Dr. The stool's going to ask me a question. <laughs> Hi, this is this is Mary. She Hi. has a question for you. I was just wondering what the average ACT score is for getting into vet school. Average ACT score? Yes. Is that what you asked? Yes, we don't look at ACT scores. We look at the GRE because that's what you're taking in college. So, no, we do, we'll look at your science GPA, in particular the 35 hours of science courses in that prereq list, and we'll look at your GRE scores. So if you're a good ACT student, or if you make a good grade in your ACT, you'll probably be well on the GRE as well. So mm -hmm. for, for early admittance students, is that do they look at the ACT or SAT since they're high school or you know just new right. freshmen? We do. So what they're asking about now is the early admit program, and there were some brochures back there. They might all be gone, but there's a mention of it on these on these papers as well. We have an early admit program for students that make an ACT score of at least 29 or above. 29 is a qualifier, and so if you make 29 or above, then you qualify for the early admit program. Uh, the process for that is that you would apply as a senior in high school. If you're definitely coming to Kansas State University, then our brochures say that the deadline for application is September 1st. That's September 1st after you graduate from high school. So that means you'd already be on the K-State campus because fall classes start in August. So you would be there, and you will, would interview during the first two weeks in September. In fact, we're doing uh, early admit interviews Friday, this Friday, for the students that are at K-State right now. The freshmen, they applied. Uh, they got everything in by September 1st. We're going to be interviewing them this Friday. Now, if some of you have high ACT scores or you're trying to decide if, if you're going to go to Kansas State to do your pre med work there and go somewhere else, you know, you, you're probably going to get lots of offers. If you have an ACT of 29 or above, uh, you're going to get lots of offers from other schools. They all want you, obviously. And so, you know, if you're trying to decide, am I going to go to Kansas State or am I going to go somewhere else to do my pre vet work? And being in the early admit program makes a difference. Then we will uh, accept your application after January 1st of your senior year in high school. So you, you send us your application. It's online. Just go to our website, home site, and uh, go to admissions, and you'll find it there. And you apply and they tell us, okay, I need to make my decision about which school I'm going to do my pre vet work at by March 15th, May 15th, April 15th, whatever the date is. And here are two or three dates that I could be in Kansas State to do my interview. And so we'll set that all up for you. We don't want you going somewhere else without knowing whether you're in the early admit program. And so we'll work with you after January 1st, your senior year in high school. We want your fall grades from your senior year in high school before we uh, before you come to interview. So if that's the case, but if you're definitely going to be a case stater, then we prefer that you just wait and do your interview during the first two weeks in September. Either way, we'll tell you right away after that uh, your status as far as the early admit program. I will tell you that we usually have about 20 to 25 applicants for the early admit program. There's uh, no set number that we have to accept or not. The Board of Regents, nobody tells us you have to take so many, or you can only take so many. And so uh, you're really competing with yourself. What we're going to be looking for are three things. We're going to be looking for documented academic ability, which you have, if you have an IACT score, that will document that you have academic ability. We're going to be looking for that community service, and so that's that volunteerism I saw better earlier. And we're going to be looking for knowledge about the profession, so that, that's a shadowing or the working for a veterinarian. We just want to know that you know something about what you're getting into. If you get into the early admit program, then what uh, the criteria for you to get into veterinary school is that you have to have at least three years of undergraduate work at K-State. You have to maintain at least a 3.4 GPA, which is like a B plus, and you have to finish all the prereqs at K-State. Now, some of you have probably uh, already gotten credit or will get credit through AP courses, or you'll take college uh, courses in high school for college credit. And so if you're taking any of our prereqs in an early admit program, then what we require that you do is not necessarily take the same course over again, although if you want to, you can, but we want you to take another course to substitute for that prereq. So in other words, if you've got your two English courses done before you get to K-State because you're taking them in high school for college credit uh, to somewhere else, 
then we would expect you to take two additional English courses in the K-6. So that would be anything with an English prefix. Introduction to poetry, novel, short story, whatever it might be. So um, it's an honors program. Now that I've told you all about that, let me say that not nearly all of our students come through the early exit program. Um, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's on a program based upon your ACT scores. So I hope that answers your question, Kelly, but that's, uh, that's how that works. And so if you, any of you have questions, let me know. If you get, have a 29 or above, I would highly encourage you to talk to me um, whenever you know that, and let's, uh, let's at least talk about the program. It's dynamite, because you're guaranteed a spot in veterinary school if you do those three things. Now, what I said earlier to you is it's about three to one. Uh, competition. So, in other words, for Kansas students, so in other words, for everyone that gets in, there's two that don't. Well, as a high school senior, graduating high school senior, you can know I'm going to have a spot very school waiting for you. It's an absolute promise. If you do those three things, you're in the early admit program, that spot is waiting for you. Um, I, I'm often asked the question so, how many of the early admit students actually become veterinarians? About 75%. You see, uh, to make the decision about what you want to do for the next 30 or 40 years, uh, right out of high school is really a pretty tall order. And so we realize there's going to be people that come to us that will say, I thought I wanted to be a veterinarian, but boy, I, I, now I'm more interested in something different. So our promise to you is absolute, but your promise to us is not. So if you change your mind, that's okay. Um, you still, uh, we'll keep that spot open for you, you know, until you tell us that you don't want it. Um, but, you know, it's, it's up to you. My poster child for that is a young lady from Boyd, Kansas. It's out in western Kansas, so you know where Boyd's at. Her dad's a veterinarian, and so I've known this uh, young lady since she was about that tall, very little girl, and all she could talk about was she would be a veterinarian just like that, go back to Boyd, Kansas, and practice her medicine with him. And so she got into the early mid program, and she, uh, after she was in it for a while, she came to me one day in my office, and she said, I'm dropping out of the early mid program. And I said, whoa, wait a minute, <laughs> this is all we've ever talked about. You know, this is, all, this is your dream. Um, what happened? She says, I hate physics, I hate chemistry, I hate every course I'm taking. Life is miserable. And I said, you know, being an undergraduate student is not supposed to be miserable. It's hard work, but it's not supposed to be miserable. What are you interested in? Well, she was interested in Spanish, and so and she was very good at Spanish. So she ended up getting her degree in Spanish. She went to Chicago, got a graduate degree in Spanish, and now she's teaching a college in Chicago, uh, Spanish. So see, she found what she wanted to do uh, during that uh, three or four years that she was at K State. That's okay. That's what going to be an undergraduate student's all about. You need to be thinking about, okay, what am I going to want to do with my career for the next 30 or 40 years? Because, um, you know, you want it to be fun, you want it to be enjoyable. So, yeah, the early mid program, uh, there were, I don't think there were enough brochures for everybody to take one, but if, you're, uh, if you qualify, let me know. Uh, drop me an email. My card is back there, and if you want to pick up my card and email me with any questions, that's okay too. The other thing I want to say before we quit here, and we need to quit pretty quickly, but if any of you want to come visit us at the Veterinary College, if you want to come take a tour of our teaching facility, our teaching hospital, our preclinical facility, call the number on my card, and probably my administrative assistant will answer, and just tell her that you're a high school student, you'd like to take a tour of my facility. They will set you up with a tour, and um, it probably will be with one of our student ambassadors. Uh, I'm in town. I'm glad to talk to you. I want to talk to you. I'll meet you again. Yeah, and answer any questions you have, but we truly are there to help you reach your career goals. We need you in our profession, and we want you to have a really happy, fulfilling profession. So don't ever hesitate to give me a call, send me an email, because I travel a lot, and email is really a good way to converse with me because I get down the road. But uh, if today we're going to come take a tour, just call and make an appointment. Uh, don't just show up, because we really need to know you're coming so we can have a student ambassador ready to give you a tour. and. Uh, you can ask how many questions you want to, too. So I'll be around for a little while. If any of you have questions, you feel free to answer. Did we get all the questions answered at CAPS? Okay. And so, again, thank you for being here. I hope that many of you will come back for some of the other presentations. And, uh, you know, come to as many as you can, as many as you want to. And, uh, you're always welcome. So thank you for being here.